Welcome to the School of Public Health. Um, Shirley said we, within this project, we were considered a leading practice site. Um, I don't quite know what that means. I think the only thing it does mean, actually, is that we have done things along the lines of what Shirley and also Miriam have theorized so beautifully, quite practically for quite a long time, and sort of out of necessity rather than out of necessarily theoretical insight, I would say. And there are a couple of people, um, <coughs> colleagues from the school here, yeah, they um, can then help talk about some, or answer some other questions. Um, so, to give you just a little bit of background, um, this, this, the School of Public Health was established 20 odd years ago. Very deliberately at the time um, to help re-establish a district health system in South Africa after 1994. Um, and uh, so that was our mission. It was very really much um, an initiative that was driven by Jack, uh, Jake Scarborough. So with the sort of the mission and the vision that, that, that you saw earlier that, that Mary, Mary showed us. Um, one difference to the other case studies you will hear about is that we are a postgraduate outfit. So it's postgraduate studies that we are, we are talking about. Um, public health generally doesn't get offered as an undergraduate degree in South Africa. Um, we move to then what was what we call distance learning um, in, in 2000. Uh, from a mix of the classic, um, often postgraduate programs, compulsory presence on campus, plus a lot of um, self-study, independent study, to optional summer going to schools, text-based modules um, with readers, phone, fax, and email. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that in contrast to the big um, distance providers in South Africa like UNISA and so on, we have a very high completion rate. So completion isn't our issue, very, uh, but sometimes um, time is. Uh, there we go. Um, why did we switch, um, switch to distance education? Um, basically to increase access. Um, all of all of the people that that make up our student population are working. Um, we wanted to reduce the time um, for traveling. Um, we took into account that uh, most of our many of our students are self-funded, um, and there was very much discourse around um, on pace uh, trying to reduce the. the dichotomy between full-time and part-time. And, but importantly, this is where our students come from. That's important and it's something that's been change, changing over time. We have students coming from all over Africa and sometimes beyond Africa. Um, Anglophone Africa, it must be said, so not trying to Africa, some Lusophone as well. And all our students are working, um, always. So they are, and they come usually from the profession, so they are doctors, nurses, physios, and so on, many of the policy makers, some of them um, in ministries and so on, uh, female and male, young and old, urban and rural. And the, the location of many of our students in rural areas was one of the key reasons also while we were in distance, because, um, at, um, because they didn't have access to universities, quite basically. Um, and uh, with or without access to technology. Um, how this, I just wanted to flash this really, um, the, the, the composition of our students changed over, sorry, changed over time. So initially it was mostly South Africans and a few from other African countries. We got to a point where it was overwhelmingly students from other African countries. Um, now it's pretty even actually. Um, in the design of our program, when we turn it into a distance program, we're very clear that our student population is made up of primarily um, new mid-level managers. Um, so people who will be running the district health system, that was, we had a very clear, clear idea of what, who our target population would be. 
Um, <coughs> and we had a very clear idea of our curriculum content, which was around building a district health system, an orientation plan, primary health care, and so on. So there was, there was strong engagement with the needs of our students and the profile of our students um, and what we wanted them to learn. The, the, the couple of things that, that have over the years um, presented some of our greatest challenges, but challenges not in, so much in the sense, of, uh, sense of, of problems, but actually trying to figure out how to do things and how, trying to figure out how we provide an education that is that is accessible, um, that is flexible, um, and nonetheless rigorous. Um, one of the things we did early on was that we brought into the department dedicated educational expertise. Um, as we all know, I and mean, many of us come from, are not educators per se, we have learned this sort of education part more or less by, by default or not at all, and some of us do it better than others and so on. So we brought um, dedicated educational expertise into the department to help us develop our learning program and the learning materials. And um, we didn't bring them down, but we developed learning materials. We, we, have, we have a whole room full of module guides and readers that come as two or three um, big packs like this. We, we are still every year sending out big boxes of, of written material every um, at the beginning of the year. Um, the idea being that our students don't always have access to technology, and that's not just a question of, of physical access, it's also a question of literacy, because our students are not the 18-year-olds, they are the 35 and 40 and 60-year-olds very often. Um, and also, because so many of our students were from rural areas, we said they have to be able to, they have to have the whole package from us. We want to encourage them to get access to libraries and so on, but we cannot assume that they definitely will. So they have to have a minimum pack to actually be able to conduct their studies. That's a huge upfront investment, um, because we have, those materials need to get written. Um, and then they need to be updated and so on. So we are all, all of us in the school who are teaching, uh, writing module guides and course materials, um, and then updating them. And that's a question of many weeks and often months of work together with the educational experts. Um, and the way that the, the, the um, approach is that of a guided didactic conversation um, with the student. And I've had students in Uganda tell me a couple of years back was, um, that when they sit at night and, and study, they, they feel like they're hearing my voice. And that was really a very nice thing to, to get feedback on. Um, the, in, in terms of assessment, again, we are not, run, and we are not writing exams. We used to have to write exams. Um, and then we would give students take-home exams, so we would send them out, um, and they had 24 hours, 24 hours, yeah, and then they had to send them back to us. Initially, that was, we received assignments handwritten and by fax. That, luckily, is not the case anymore now. We've switched to email fairly, fairly early on. Very, very, very importantly, um, in our approach has been, so we have students who are juggling work and their social engagements and study. Um, and they're battling, they're battling like they're battling to keep time. That, it's, it's, it's really, really hard to do for them. Um, so our admin support and logistics are absolutely vital. Our student, two student administrators are sitting here. They are sort of the first point of call. They have to, they stay in touch. Um, and without the, them, it wouldn't work. Um, the, the need for students to actually, when they, when they study by themselves and study at their own pace, the, the, the ease with which they could actually drop out um, is, is, is huge um, because there are so many competing demands. So actually, the sort of supporting and shoving and cajoling and sometimes um, pressurizing students is a, is, is a really fine art. Um, and 
we've, we've developed it out of need more than because we had very good insights all the time. Um, our students also come back, uh, come for, when they can, to our winter school. So the, our, we've been running winter schools with short courses for the last 25 years, I think, every year. And those winter schools are an important portal for our students. When Miriam was talking about the, that it takes a while from um, sort of engaging with, with an institution to actually enrolling for a degree, um, I think that is true for our students as, as well. And many, many of our students tell us they first heard about it during winter schools, they came to a couple of courses and so on, and then eventually they applied. Um, so this is the great juggle, I think for working students generally, and therefore for educators to get that balance right. When I started teaching on this program, I always thought we have to accommodate, accommodate students. We have, they have to be able to do things at their pace. You can't pressurize them. You do give them extensions if they need extensions. And I've come to realize that's not always helpful. Um, and getting that right is, is actually something that's really, really hard. Um, yes, they need their own pace. Yes, life happens. Yes, they have a million um, competing commitments. Family, very often social engagements, particularly with women, church or whatever. Um, a lot of work and very often, often quite pressurized work. But if you allow them to work at their own pace, they don't finish. Um, and that was an insight. I mean, that's something we had to learn by, by experience. Um, so, on the one hand, we want to give them access, we want to allow them to, to study at their own pace, but they also have to be able to, 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 to finish, um, so they need the push. Um, and the other thing that's really difficult to retain is the social interaction. So, if one, if one thinks about learning as, as a, a social engagement, um, then the, the form of study that relies to a very, very large degree to study by on your own, um, is is not necessarily very conducive to to engagement, to learning from each other, and so on. People who come to our winter schools um, gain a lot from that, also the engagement with lecturers. But there are people who we've never seen. I mean, I've had have students who graduated, I've never seen them in my life, um, and that's a lonely endeavor. Then, um, so that's what we are battling with. Um, time to study, the interaction, and what kind of support um, we can give them. Um, and what we are in the process of doing right now, and we are at the beginning stages really, is to explore what emerging technologies offer us um, for, for better social interaction in particular. So how, how can we make use of anything from Google Groups, to Canva sites, to um, online teaching, and so on, um, that allows us to, to sort of grab back some of the interactivity of, of the learning process. So that's what we will be working on um, over the next couple of years, getting better at that. And um, so those are the things we, we think we um, <coughs> allow us to, 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 ex to, to extend and, and expand the kind of teaching we are doing in the kind of areas that we are, we are involved in, um, making use of new, new technologies as they unfold. And of course, that is something that um, is, is rolling at the moment. It's very hard to, to be at the, at the front of it. Um, and, and here again, we juggle with the, with the um, literacies, I suppose, of our students. Um, what our own literacy is, so that's a big battle at the moment. We have to learn to do things differently, and that's not necessarily easy. Um, and then what the, what the actual uh, connectivity is um, in Africa, around the world, and that's very hard to gauge. Thank you very much.